I have a confession to make to you this morning, and it is this, uh, that my sinful flesh is probably most active when my stomach is the least full. Uh, In those moments where I have to wait for food, perhaps I show up to a restaurant and they tell me the wait will be an hour, or perhaps I was expecting food at a certain time or expecting a certain type of food and got something different, I struggle with patience. And my sanctification is threatened deeply at those types of moments. Uh, Allow me to illustrate. This past Christmas, uh, my wife and I ordered some tamales to eat on Christmas Eve. I know many of you probably have that same tradition around here. Uh, Shannon called the order in weeks ahead of time and said that we wanted it to be ready around 4 p.m. on Christmas Eve. And the plan was I would go pick up the tamales, and then I would come home, and then we would go to church to worship on Christmas Eve together, and then come home and eat them. So she ordered about three dozen pork tamales. We had some friends coming over, so ordered some extras. I called around 3.30, and I said, uh, I'm calling about an order for Shannon. Uh, Will those be ready? We ordered them for four. They said, absolutely, 15 minutes, they ought to be ready, come on out. So I got in my car, I drove out there, I walked in, I said, I'm here to pick up an order for Shannon, three dozen pork tamales, and I noticed that our order was not lined up along the counter like other people's orders were. And uh, as I was talking, the woman who was in the back making the tamales looked up and said to her coworker, the pork is all gone, like that. And at that same moment, I looked over and I saw a family who had come in just before me with an enormous cooler, and they were stuffing it full of pork tamales. And I thought, those are my tamales. They're eating my tamales. And the man said, "Uh, if you come back in an hour or two, we'll have more. And I said, well, I can't come back in an hour or two. I have somewhere I need to be. I didn't tell him I was going to church because I could feel the anger welling up in me, and I didn't want to say it right at that moment. I said, I can't come back, and I started to feel frustrated, and I asked him, I don't think I yelled at him, I asked him, why did you take more orders than you could manage? In my mind, this was just a simple matter of numbers, right? Just figure it out, and I was going to instruct him and fix their system, right? He said, I'm really sorry, it just is the way it happened. We made something like 18,000 tamales today or something like that. And I I worked ahead and I said, okay, well, what can you give me right now? And he looked around and he managed to cobble together 10 pork tamales. I don't know if he found them under the sofa or something, but he put them up on the counter and he goes, and then I have these chicken ones that you can have also. So I said, okay, boo, right? But I'll take them. I ordered pork. I got in the car, and I was flustered, and I was frustrated, and I was angry. And as I drove away, then it hit me that I was on my way to go celebrate the greatest act of selflessness in the history of humanity. And I was tied up in knots about my tamale rights as an American. And the contrast struck me, and it convicted me deeply. Because at that moment, selfishness threatened to sabotage my worship of God. What happens when you and I enter into worship with hearts and minds that are selfish? When we enter into worship with hearts and minds that are selfish, the challenge we face is that we're unable to appropriately focus on God because we're thinking about ourselves. We're unable to appropriately celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus because we're thinking of ourselves. If you pause for just a minute and you think about your typical Sunday experience This may be a challenge for you. I know sometimes it is for me. Maybe it starts at home as everybody's in a rush to get out the door and you leave the house and you're feeling a little frazzled and then you drive up here and the reason you were trying to leave early is because you know what the parking lot will look like when you get here. And so you're already frustrated with your roommate or your spouse or your kids because they made you late and you pull up and the parking lot is starting to fill and you circle the parking lot and you see that senior citizen spot, right? And your spouse says, you're only 43. And you go, isn't that close enough in this town? Come on. And you want to take it. But you don't. You leave the lot and you drive down the street and you park a half mile away and you walk in and you walk in the door. You grab a bulletin and you walk in here and your seat is taken. 
the seat you've occupied for 27 years every Sunday is gone by somebody who just showed up this morning. And you think, should I tell them it's my seat? You know, nah, probably not, right? And so you move to a different spot. And then the music starts and they play a song that isn't really your style. Right? Maybe you're a college student and you like music that's more cutting edge and you're, they're singing something from 1723. Or maybe you grew up singing hymns and they're singing stuff that sounds cutting edge to you and you go, why is it that all of the other people in here like to sing songs that don't speak to me? And our hearts and our minds are consumed with what can I get out of the service rather than walking in and saying, I want to center my heart and my mind on Jesus and then look around and say, how can I serve and facilitate the worship of the others in this room? to recognize that I'm not just here to have an experience between me and God, but instead to have an opportunity to worship God and then allow that worship to drive the way I treat other people here, when I leave here, and throughout the week. Uh, The first century church struggled with many of the same issues that plague us because they lived in a culture like we do that was consumed with status and importance and personal rights and what can I get and where can I make my mark on the world. And so they wrestled with these issues. And in our passage this morning, Paul addresses those issues. He addresses them from the standpoint of the Lord's Supper. Because when they came to worship every week, they would partake of the Lord's Supper, of the bread and the wine. And that was the central focus of their worship, was remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus. And yet as they came into worship, they were doing the Lord's Supper in a way that dragged in all the selfishness from their culture. And they were using the worship time as an opportunity to elevate themselves at the expense of other people, to claim their rights, and to divide up into their groups based around who had more money, who was more important, and their own comfort. And in 1 Corinthians 11, although it is a passage that deals extensively with the Lord's Supper, the fundamental issue is where are our hearts when we come to worship God? Because selfishness will sabotage worship. But the good news is that worship drives out selfishness. When I am consumed with the worship of God, that ought to push thoughts of self away. And if Paul were writing 1 Corinthians 11 to us, the cultural issues would be a little different, but I believe he would still push us to ask these questions. What are you reflecting on when you come in the door? Who fills the center of your thoughts? Is it self or is it Jesus? As you walk in, does it occur to you and me that the person walking in over here or over here had the same stressful experience coming in this morning as we did, maybe even worse. And what they're looking for is to know God, to worship God, and to find a community that will facilitate that for them rather than a community of people who will seek our own interests, divide up according to our own preferences and cliques and comforts. Those issues have plagued the church from the beginning. And ultimately, Paul says that the effectiveness of our testimony for Jesus Christ really hinges on how we approach worship. Because worship drives our service and our evangelism and our attitudes toward others. And selfishness sabotages worship, but worship will drive out selfishness. And Paul begins explaining that concept first by saying this, in worship there are no VIPs. Look at verses 17 to 22. But in giving this instruction, I do not praise you because you come together not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that divisions exist among you. And in part, I believe it, for there must also be factions among you so that those who are approved may become evident among you. Therefore, when you meet together, it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, for in your eating, each one takes his own supper first, and one is hungry and another is drunk. 
What? Do you not have houses in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? In this I will not praise you. Paul begins by saying, the way that you guys are doing worship, Corinthian church, actually makes things worse. In other words, he's going to say, it would be better for you to stay at home than to do worship in the selfish way that you're approaching it. And what was it they were doing? It helps to understand a little bit of the cultural background. In the first century, they did not meet in church buildings like we meet in this morning. They typically met in homes. And the type of people who had a home large enough to accommodate the church, those were usually the wealthy people, those who had the money to purchase such a home. So in Corinth, you may have had 50 to 100 individuals meeting in someone's house. And the way that their houses were designed was that as you entered the house, there would be kind of an atrium or a courtyard where people could stand and they could talk and they could socialize. And then they might move back into a dining room at the back of the house that was also called the triclinium. And in the triclinium, there would be pillows seated around a table where the guests would recline on the pillows around a low table and they would eat the meal together. And, and just like you read uh, in John when Jesus celebrates the Last Supper with his disciples, they would have reclined around this table. Remember how uh, one disciple's head is on Jesus' chest. They would have been close together, but they would have been around a table. You maybe could fit 10, maybe 12 people in that room. And what they would do is they would, just as Jesus did at the Passover supper, they would take the bread and they would remember the body of Jesus. And then after the supper, they would take the cup, this third cup of the Passover, actually, and remember the death of Jesus. Now, here was the problem in the Corinthian church. Uh, the triclinium couldn't fit everybody who came. So how did they decide who got to be in the comfortable room and who had to stand out in the atrium crammed with 50 other people eating crumbs. Well, if you were wealthy, if you were important, if you were a friend, a special friend of the homeowner, you got to be back in the dining room. While those who were less significant or poorer would stand out in the foyer, in the atrium, around a pool, crammed together. And back in those days, everybody probably brought their own food. And the wealthy people would bring enormous dinners and sit back in the triclinium and gorge themselves and get drunk while the poorer in the congregation would stand in the atrium and eat their cheese sandwich or whatever they had. And so they were creating these divisions amongst them based on class, based on who made money, based on status, based on who was important. And so they entered the worship service with this mindset of, how can I elevate myself? And Paul says, that way of approaching the Lord's Supper is antithetical to what it means. And you had best just stay home. If you, all you want to do is eat and get drunk, just stay home. And the idea is this, that the church of God ought to be the one place in the world where the divisions, according to status and class, that permeate the world around, where those divisions have no place. The church ought to be the one place where we all come together on equal footing before God. And the reason is this, because all of us recognize that before God, we come poor. Before God, none of us have a thing to offer. And what we come to celebrate is that in our poverty God gave us the riches of Jesus Christ. So if I come in and my mindset is, I want to worship like my people like to worship. I want to sit with my people in my seat. I want to park in the best spot. I want to be valued. I want to be appreciated. If that is the mindset, Paul says we're on dangerous footing. Our world is full of divisions according to status and class and wealth, isn't it? Uh, all you got to do is get on an overseas airplane flight and you can see it. Right? Those who have flown overseas know that uh, you might pass the first class seating, although these days they often even put the first class seating somewhere uh, where you can't even see it 
You may not even pass it, but they're in large pods and they can recline and they get to eat filet mignon or whatever they want and they're drinking expensive uh, wines up there and they get to move around and they have their own bathroom. And then you have business class, which is a little bit less expensive, but still very nice, a plush seat. And you've got maybe 20 people who share one bathroom and all of this food and everything you want. And then you've got coach, which is where the majority of us sit most of the time where you're crammed in a row with eight people like this, right? And you eat whatever they give you and you like it, okay? (laughs) If you stand up to stretch, the air marshal might tackle you, okay? And we expect that when we get onto an airplane. In fact, uh, several years ago, just by random chance, Shannon and I on a flight back from Asia got bumped up to business class. And it was wonderful. A long flight, probably a 20-hour flight, and we were in a nice leather seat and just had all of this space and all of this food. And you know what happened, actually, is by the time the plane landed, I thought, I must be as important as they're telling me I am while I'm up here. And I began to feel more important than I really was. I kind of wanted the plane just to keep going and just go back, come back again, right? We'll just do this for several days. We expect that when we go out in the world. When you go to a football game, you expect there are expensive seats and cheap seats. When we move in our circles in this community, we expect that people divide up according to career, according to size of home, according to salary, according to race, according to class, according to all of those things. Yet what Paul says is when we come in here, this ought to be the one place in the world where none of those divisions make a difference. College student, or adult, married, single, kids, no kids, white collar, blue collar, 10,000 square foot house, small dorm room. But we all come before God equal because there are no VIPs. Paul says, I will not commend you for treating the church as if some people matter more than others. And the reason is this, because Jesus is right at the center of our worship, not you or me. Jesus is right at the center of our worship. The other way to put this is if there is a VIP in this room, it's Jesus. And he's the only one. The only very important person in this room is Jesus. And it is he that we all come to bow before, to worship, to make the center. Look at verses 23 to 27. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What Paul says is when you come into worship and when you participate in communion and when you sing and when you serve, you are celebrating the fact that Jesus died for us in our place and rose again. And as I said a few moments ago, it is the greatest act of selflessness in the history of the universe. As Philippians 2 says, that he is equal to God, yet did not consider that equality with God a thing to be grasped, to be held onto, right? But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself even to the point of death, to the point of death on a cross. And when we come to worship, we remember that. And we worship him now who is risen. And every knee will bow as we sing. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I am not at the center of the worship service. And you are not at the center of the worship service. It is Jesus Christ. And when we come in and we put Jesus in the center of our thoughts and in the center of our affections, that ought to drive away any thought that I'm here for my own preferences, that I'm here for my own comfort, that I'm here for my own social life, that I'm here for any reason other than to stand with other poor sinners and say, thank you for your death and resurrection for me. Everybody who has been to a birthday party for a small child, particularly those who are preschool age, two to five or so, know that there's often a moment 
when a child whose birthday it is not bursts into tears because it is not his birthday. As he sees the guest of honor receive all of the presents and get the largest piece of cake and everybody sings to the guest of honor, there is often a child who bursts into tears because he wants the presents. Maybe even the present he brought. It occurs to him at that moment, this isn't for me. And starts to cry. And if you're a parent of that child, which many of you have been, you know exactly what you have to do. You take that child aside and you take them outside and you have the conversation again that you probably had in the car already, but you have to repeat it. This is not your party. Uh, This is February. Your birthday is in October. We had your party. This is Billy's party. So he will get the presents. He will get the cake. He will get all the honor. And you'll be happy about it. (laughs) Or we'll go home, okay? Because it's not your party. When you and I walk into this room, it is not our party. It's Jesus's. Just as we celebrated baptism earlier, in a little while, we're going to celebrate communion. And just like these bookends are on our service What we're celebrating is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for us. And it's not our party. So we place him at the very center. From the moment we leave our house to driving into the parking lot to coming into the room, we center our thoughts on Jesus. And that drives us to care for the others in our midst. To look around and say, how can I facilitate their worship? How can I draw in those who may be feeling excluded? Perhaps instead of always just having lunch with those who are like me or those that I know, what if I draw in those that seem like they're on the outside? What if I take that attitude of worship where Jesus' humility and service is at the center of my mind and I take that attitude out into the world with me, what kind of testimony would the church of God be able to have? Jesus is the very center of all that we do. It drives everything we say, everything we sing, every act of service, every moment of evangelism. We place him at the center and say there's no VIPs in this room except one. And Paul warns this church that hypocrisy in this actually invites the judgment of God. Uh, Hypocrisy actually comes from a Greek word. Many of you have heard this before, uh, hupo. Chrysis, hupo Chrysis, which is the idea that uh, as an actor would get up on the stage and they would play different parts, they would put on a mask. It is the putting on of a mask. And the idea when it is used in the scripture is that I come into worship and I raise my hands and I sing these songs about the greatness of God and about the humility of Jesus. And yet my heart and my actions and my mind are selfish. And the reason that I'm really here is all about me. That is hypocrisy. And it isn't just in the church, but you see this thread weave its way through the Old Testament as well, that God takes worship seriously. And he takes putting on the mask seriously, which is why I believe Paul says it would be better just to eat at home than to come in with this attitude of utter selfishness in the worship service. Look at verses 27 to 34. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another or show hospitality or favor to one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. 
What is he getting at? He's saying if you come in and you partake of the body and the blood of Christ. Now, now Paul is not saying, by the way, that they are physically or supernaturally somehow transformed into the body and the blood of Christ. Instead, he is saying you come in and you are reenacting the Last Supper and you are remembering what Jesus has done, that this is a memorial. And if you come in and you do that with this heart of utter selfishness and you shut some people out while you go in your back room and you make it all about me, if you do that, you are lining up with the powerful rulers of the world who crucified Jesus. And that will invite judgment. He's not saying you will lose eternal life. If you have believed in Jesus Christ, that he died and rose again to pave the way for your eternal life, and you trust in him, you have that. It cannot be taken away. Now, what was happening in this church instead was that they were being physically judged. Some of them were getting sick Some of them were even dying. And the reason, Paul says, is this, that God will purify his church so that it can worship correctly. So it is not condemned along with the world. So it doesn't lose its influence. So it doesn't die out. God will purify it. Paul says this type of hypocrisy invites pain and judgment and trouble on the people of God because God takes worship seriously. As I mentioned, this thread goes all the way back into the Old Testament. Look at Micah chapter 6. Micah says, With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I present to my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Micah says, God prefers selflessness that reflects the character of God. He prefers that to empty offerings, meaningless songs, and a worship service that is not centered on God. And Paul indicates that such worship brings the disapproval and possibly even the judgment of God. But when we worship in a way that celebrates Christ's humility and selflessness, and when we evidence that in our community, in the way we treat others, we can have an impact that spreads through our community and draws people to Jesus. I've been reading the last couple of weeks a biography of George Whitfield the famous 18th century preacher and uh, reviver, great awakener from England. George Whitfield uh, was this British preacher who preached in the fields and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And along with uh, Wesley and Edwards and other preachers of the era, they inaugurated what is now known as the first great awakening, a great revival both in Britain and in the United States where many, many people came to know Jesus and trust in him. New churches sprang up that were vibrant and alive And at least part of the reason for the First Great Awakening was this, that the churches in the 18th century, particularly in England, but to some extent in the United States, the churches were oriented around social status and personal preference and class. You could pay a certain amount of money and get the pew that you wanted to sit in. Even the priests were often beholden to the wealthier members of the congregation, So that those who were poor, those who had less status, often were outside. And they looked at the church and said, there's nothing there for me. It's just like the world around. And one of the things that made Whitfield's ministry powerful was that from the very beginning as he preached outside, he said, there's no division here. Whether you're a pauper or a king, if you get here and there's a space on the front row, You're welcome to sit close and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ because we all stand equal before God as sinners in need of a Savior. And that permeated the ministry of Whitfield and the Wesleys in particular and other reformers of the era. And out of their ministry sprang up what we now know as evangelicalism, that churches who emphasized 
a relationship with Jesus because of his death and resurrection. Those churches flourished and grew, and the churches that were focused on class and status dwindled, and their influence waned and eventually went away. Uh, You and I are recipients of their ministry, and yet the warning to us is as poignant as it was 2,000 years ago or 200 years ago, that God cares about the way we approach worship, perhaps more than He cares about acts of service that we do even. He cares that we walk in here and we orient our minds and our hearts on Him. And then that ought to drive us to care for the others in our midst and outside our doors because we're focused on the death and resurrection of Jesus. And I think often one of the ways that God judges a church is not merely by sickness or death amongst the congregation, but also just the waning influence of a church in the culture. And yet if we can drive this selfishness out and say, when I come in here, I want to fill my mind and heart with Jesus Christ. I want to worship Him and then imitate His pattern of humility and selflessness. I believe that the testimony we can have in our community will multiply and expand and draw people to know Jesus. So worship drives out selfishness, but selfishness can sabotage our worship. In just a few moments, we're going to celebrate communion, and as the men get ready for communion, there's a couple of applications I want to leave us with, a couple of things to reflect on as we prepare for communion. First of all, as you come in each morning, whether we're serving communion or not, place your focus on Jesus. In fact, perhaps begin on Saturday night. Maybe read Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, about the humility of Jesus Christ. So that when you wake up in the morning, your mindset is, how can I focus on Him and what He has done? And let that be the center of my worship instead of my own preferences. And then aim to serve those around you. How can you give somebody else the best seat, the best parking place? Perhaps you can serve in the nursery so that one week a nursery worker can sit and worship. Perhaps you can be joyful about songs that aren't your favorite so that we all can worship God together and remember that this is about Him, not about my preferences. How can I aim to serve those that are here with me? As we prepare for communion, then let's reflect upon those things. And as Paul says, examine our hearts and our minds and where they are before the Lord. And are we celebrating the bread and the cup in an attitude that is consistent with the humility and selflessness of Jesus Christ?